had the last month or so uh, had us in a vein of understanding who we are in a different light. It's one that, uh, well, I'm just going to bring it from a different, different perspective, maybe a different angle from the Word. You know, the Word speaks to one truth in many different ways. And so I think God has ordained it. Why? I, that's what I'm, I've been asking the Lord. Why, Lord? It's all of this has been so similar and so leading up to, you know, my part in this. Why do we need to camp out on this? We've been in this vein for over a month, and I don't understand why. Maybe it's because we need it pretty soon, huh? Do you think? But I'm going to speak on something that's really unpopular this morning, I'm gonna just going to break it open a little. I'm, we could be here for a really long time. I don't intend to do that. Uh, Lord helping me, I'll keep it fairly as brief as possible without uh, doing disservice to what he wants to get across this morning. So, I'm going to speak to you about the refiner's fire. kind of a heavy subject nobody really wants to hear about it nobody wants to dwell on it but the reality is that it's real <laughs> and it and we live in that place a lot especially in these days anybody here have issues <laughs> besides me nobody's immune does anybody feel under pressure these days anybody having confrontations and conflict Anybody having stuff mess up every which way you turn, you're trying to cry out to the Lord, and you're wondering why all of this faith that we preach here so strongly isn't working for you so good. Anybody in that boat with me? Well, God's not ignorant of the situation. Amen? The Scripture is pretty plain. It, he talks, the Scripture talks about him being totally aware of everything from beginning to end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter of the alphabet, and he knows everything between. The Scripture says he knows all, but he is all. He exists all. The Scriptures call out in the heavenlies, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. In Malachi, God said, I, the Lord, do not change. He's everywhere. The psalmist said, where can I go? I can go to the highest heights, there you are. I can go to the lowest depths, there you are. And we think a whole lot about that issue, about God's everywhere, all at the same time. Worship has been raised up from this planet since before we got up this morning. And as the sun goes around and we make the circuit of the day, church after church, believer after believer, may be huddled under trees or in bushes or even in hidden places in some countries. Praise and worship have been lifted up. And he's all there at the same time. Right now, he's in, he's in Africa. He's in Japan. He's, in, he's everywhere, all right now. He's aware right now. He is so everywhere, it's all one eternal banquet for him on today because that's when the church comes together to worship and glorify him together. But it's not just everywhere. Do you realize it's every when? We think everywhere when God created, you know, he spoke a word and the universe was created. It wasn't just length and width and breadth or height that was created. It was also time. Science calls all the time. They talk about time and space, two different things. Well, God is the one who created it. Amen? He created time. He is outside of time. He is above time. He created time. And there's never a time when he isn't the same person. We've already talked about that from beginning to end. He's the same. Jesus Christ, forever. The same. Yesterday, today, forever. 
you ever stop to think how he can remain unchanged? It's because he's not just everywhere at the same time. He's every when at the same time. It's all one eternal now to him. That's why he doesn't change. It's more than that, obviously. There's more that I can't grasp or any of us can grasp. But one reason why you can, it's like, you know, I'm, well, I won't go there, but I don't matter that much in the scheme of things. It's him that's the important one to focus on this morning. But anywhere, if he were able to be cut and bleed, he would bleed and cut. No matter where you cut him, it would be the same. No matter where you sample him, no matter where you experience him, he's the same. He's the same yesterday. He's the same now as when you first met him. He will be the same when you come face to face with him that you know now. What changes is our perspective. What changes is our understanding. What changes is our ability to connect with him on deeper and deeper levels. And you already know that. It's like a little baby when it's born. Can't even crawl. Everything is about me. Parents running back and forth to the bottle or whatever, nursing, taking care of them, changing diapers, spending money, going to doctors, getting booster shots, spending money. They grow up a little bit, begin to walk, got to take things up off the table and put them up, spend more money. Kind of camping out on money today. I don't know why. But you know, and you don't expect a whole lot out of them. And they're so self-centered. It's like, grow up. They are. <laughs> so pretty soon, then they have to start doing chores and complain. Et cetera, et cetera. That's how we are. We come into the kingdom, we're newborns. We're fed with the milk of the word. We have to grow enough to be able to understand a few things before we can progress. Little baby, when you, you give him the bottle or you give him the Gerber split peas, which I hate. Yuck. But you got to spoon feed them until they're old enough to take, a, take their own spoon and get it all over themselves and some of it in their mouth. And they begin to learn how to feed themselves, how to dress themselves, how to, you know, do what they're supposed to do in the morning to get ready, et cetera, et cetera. That's like us in the spiritual realm. When you're newborn, you don't know enough to even feed yourself. You have to be shown. You have to be mentored, hopefully by your parents in the natural or at least a spiritual father like we've been talking about and spiritual moms too. I've got both in my life, thankfully. But finally, you get to a place where I've, I've been able to, by the grace of God, assimilate some truth and I begin to understand who I am, who he is, what the church is, and what we're about. And he, he'll never stop adding to that, by the way, to deeper revelation. But at one point, I began to start reaching out in faith and trying to press into a place that I've never been and I've heard about. And that, this church is real good about that. We talk about the days coming when just for the subject of healing, for example. People are going to be healed when they come up here. We're going to see wheelchairs thrown away. We're going to see limbs that are missing grow out. We're going to see eyes that aren't working or maybe not even there be there. And we've already heard testimonies about that happening, just not in foreign countries, but even in the United States. There have been little sprinklings, you know, right? We're expecting that. We're, we're By faith, we're taking hold of that promise and trying to move into it. But why is it so hard? Why does it take so long? Does it drive you crazy? It drives me crazy, but you know, it didn't used to. I used to not worry about that because I had no faith for it in the first place. But when, I, when you get faith for something like that and you have an expectation, then it puts you on the road to press into it and want it and yearn for it and pray for it, and believe for it, et cetera, et cetera, until you just, I think the Lord has designed, I know he's designed it to, to hit a brick wall where we've done everything we know to do. We've prayed, we've cried, we've shouted, we've praised, we've worshiped, we've, I mean, you name it. I, I'm as clean as I know to be, which isn't a whole lot. 
There's a lot more to go for all of us. But it's just not coming easily. It's coming. I just can't see it yet. And that's what faith's all about, right? Faith is what's really out there, but, but we don't see it yet. If it was sight, it wouldn't be faith. You've got to believe for it. But our faith, we work out our faith. We do things in faith to give that promise substance. You know what the word says? Faith is a substance, substance of things not seen. But then some weird person like Rob comes and he's going to drop something on you. I'm going to mess with you today. But it's not just me. I'm going to share my pain. Because <laughs> the Lord's been messing with me for a long time. Right out of the Word, I want us to go to Revelation 3, 18 and 19. And we're going to skip 21, 20 and 21 and go to 22. But here's Jesus. He's right to the, the church in Thyatira. And he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And finally, in verse 22, the last part of the letter to that church, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Right here is part of the answer to why I don't see what I'm yearning for and what I'm standing for and praying for and believing for in faith. And, it, and it's not coming into, though there is a substance to it of sorts, it's not here. Here's one reason why. It may be one of the major, major main reasons. I'm not sure. Look first at, at that last verse, Revelation 3.22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, just because you have a working ear and uh, you can hear through that ear, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to receive what the Spirit's saying this morning to this church. Amen? Because hearing is more than the auditory signals being received and transmitted to your brain. It's more than you even understanding what is being said this morning. Or read. If you're reading from the Word, you can hear too. <laughs> Only that your hearing's coming through your eyeballs. How weird is that? Right? Because you're not the only one there. In fact, the very word in the Scripture for conscience means co-perception. You're not the only one reading the Scripture. You're all alone in your prayer closet, but guess who else is there reading it with you? The Spirit that's in you. It's co-perception. Now, he perceives it all very well because he wrote it. He knows what he meant to say and what he has said. I, on the other hand, sometimes am, am blocked by, from, by many ways and whatever. But as I read, he wants to uh, give it to me. Remember, it's an issue of progressive revelation. What he gives James today, I may not know that for another decade. Or maybe I got it 10 years ago. Does that mean, if I got it 10 years ago, does that mean I'm so much more mature than him spiritually? No. It just means that I could receive it back then. And the reason he didn't get it 10 years ago, it, God wasn't ready to give it to him until today. Does that make sense? What you get today and I don't have for another 10 years, is a, he doesn't tell me because I'm not ready for it. Does that make sense? God's in control of all that. That's why none of us are the same. We go to classes. Even in a class, you can be having this information imparted, and everybody's going to receive it on a totally different level, how it applies to you. And the Holy Spirit's the one that does that. He's the one that applies the Scripture. Some of it comes, all of it really comes in seed form. But how long might that seed lie dormant before it explodes into life? Maybe a long time. In fact, you will have forgotten that you even heard that. Maybe it's in there baking all that amount of time. But verse uh, there, that verse in 322, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. Now, it's not just what you hear. Scripture talks about biblical hearing as including another word in the English that's lost in the translation. 
it's not just hearing, but it's heeding. How many times did your dad say something to you and you it went one ear and right out the other? Did you have trouble hearing him? No. Did you have trouble understanding him? No. The trouble is, I didn't want to hear what I heard and I ain't doing what he said. Right? Biblical hearing is not like that. Biblical hearing is when you understand what's being said, you have a predisposition in your spirit to be obedient to the Father. That's biblical hearing. It's not just understanding the words, it's doing the words. A little while ago I prayed, Lord, grant us the grace or grant us the power or grant us a heart that wants to be ready to say yes and amen to what you tell us this morning. That is a mindset. It's a mindset. All of us need that mindset because how many times has God sent something that you didn't want to hear? Anybody? Just me? Lord, I didn't need to hear that. Well, apparently you did because I just spoke it to you. and you didn't... Yeah, but I didn't want. He said, well, I don't care exactly. I mean, I care what you want, but I want to rebuild you in such a way that, that you want what I want. Amen? So what has that got to do with my hard times and all the junk that's going on? Well, if, if we understand that if we biblically hear what he says, he wants to add things to us to cause us to walk in victory to walk in power, to walk in love. In fact, the whole ordeal is all about making us to look just like him and to walk in the same power as he does. Okay? So it would be good on the front end to say, Lord, I don't know what you're fixing to tell me, but my answer is yes and amen. I don't care how hard it is or how much I dislike it because I know I trust you and I know that that you have my interest at the core of your heart to make me better and to bless me. I'm a child of the king. I'm a co-heir with Christ. All of us are. If you know Jesus, that's who you are. And so why not just get that out of the way right at the beginning and say, I don't care, Lord, what it's going to cost me. If I have to die, that's okay. Because I want what you have for me. Wouldn't that make a lot more sense? Hey, it would be a lot less painful Let's back up to Revelation 3.19. Let me kind of get this thing. In the midst of your trials, your tribulation, the misery, the hard parts of life, the dryness, I, whatever you're going through that's not good, at least it appears to be not good, there is one eternal truth that you need to know and you need to make a really big deal in your life. And it will make it so much better for you to go through those difficult times. And that's found in 319. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. What? You know what chasten means, right? Basically, it means to discipline. Sometimes in the woodshed. That's old time. <laughs> Taking the belt off. You hear that snap, snap, snap when it hits the rungs on your pant. You know, it's like, uh-oh. That's when I start looking to see if my brothers and sisters are around, or if it's just me, I know I've got a lot of something. You know, if it's my brother or sister, maybe I'm okay. I'm not sure, but as many as I love, I rebuke and listen. What does rebuke mean? That means when I'm heading in a direction, a big old hand comes down and creates a giant stop sign that I run into. That's a rebuke. When I spout off something that I know to be absolutely true, and the Lord comes with his word and smacks me in the face with that hammer of the word and says, you got it wrong, son. That's a rebuke. But he doesn't stop there. In the scripture, in 2 Timothy 3.16, he talks about the scripture, what, they're, what it's good for, right? It's good for rebuke, but it's also good for correction. He doesn't just beat you up because you got it wrong. He wants to show you the right because he still intends to use you as his spokesman, his ambassador to take the fragrance of Christ throughout the whole world, all right? So don't. why does he always rebuke and chasten, though? It hurts. It hurts. I don't like it. Well, it, here he said, it's because he loves you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. If you're not being chastened and rebuked today, you better check out your salvation. 
Because he says, as many as I love. Well, if you're not being rebuked and chastened, then maybe you've missed the boat. You think you're okay. Maybe you got a policy for your fire insurance in your pocket instead of a relationship of covenant with the living God. And that paper will burn. But the relationship with Christ will not. And as I'm being rebuked and chastened, he has a bit of, of uh, encouragement there. He, he says, because, therefore, means for all of that that just I said, <laughs> right? You're being rebuked and chastened because I need you to be zealous and repent. Zealous, that's a good word. Who's speaking here? Let me read you 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Do we have that one in the stack? 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Beloved, let us, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. You hear that? How's your love quotient today? Is it high? Is it like his? That word that he uses over and over in those verses is agape, 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 agape. And it's not the same love as I have for my brother. That's phileo, brotherly love, brotherly kindness and affection. It's not the same as some, of, some kind of love that I have with my wife that is erotic in nature. That's eros, that's, but that, that is a love that God made. And it's meant to be, meant to be exhibited in, in that marital relationship that we have. But this kind of love is different from those two. It's agape. It's the kind of love that God has toward us. Now, so what kind of love did Jesus... What's the greatest expression of love by God ever in the history of the world? Pardon? Yeah, think about the crucifixion. The very Son of God, sinless, perfect, who on purpose laid down His glory just so He could come here and be mistreated, misunderstood, abused, and killed. Why? John 3.16. For God so agape the world that He gave. greatest picture of agape that could ever exist was a man that was beaten so badly you couldn't even tell he was a man and hung cursed on a tree mistreated the perfect sacrifice to remove all sin our sin so I want you to paint that backdrop right now in your mind. You, if you need to close your eyes, do so. Whatever image that you can possess in your heart and your soul about what the crucifixion looks like, paint that like a mural. Okay, right now in your mind. Paint it. Now I want you to hang that picture on the backdrop as a backdrop behind your life. So that as you review your life this morning, as the Spirit begins to bring things to your mind, I want you to see the outpouring of love behind whatever you're going through. So what's your biggest issue today? Your job? Family trouble? Finances? Health? What's the biggest challenge you face? The biggest disappointment that you have? The biggest failure? As you think about that and look at that, do it with the backdrop of Christ on the cross, the ultimate expression of love for you. If you're spiritually reborn, he agapes you. But why does he love you? That's a good question to ask. I've asked that question. Lord, I don't even, there's nothing good in me. I don't see why you love me. I've, I've, I've failed so many times. I've, you know, 
et cetera, et cetera. I'm no good. I don't have anything to offer you that's worthy and blah, blah, blah. All, the, all my excuses, whatever I throw up there, out of my wounds. And the reason that he loves you is because agape flows out of him. That's who he is. God is love, according to what we just read. He can't help it. <laughs> love flows out of him. And now that he lives in you as a child of God, it's only natural that he oozes love for you out of who he is in you. I mean, it's just who he is. We don't think about him that way, really, uh, if you've been in some of my classes, you've heard me say this, but I'm trying to make a really big deal out of it. If that's who God is, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and never changing, then there's never going to be a time as his child that he won't love you. Agape. Does that make sense? Let's re let us reason. Come, let us reason together, God says. All right? So, if you're having hard times today and you're pleading and shouting sometimes, stomping your feet, beating your head against the wall and screaming mad at God, saying, why are you doing this to me? In fact, you might even be thinking, well, he's given up on me. Even though he called me to this and it hadn't come and hadn't come, he's turned his back on me. Anybody ever thought those kind of things? I'm not worthy. I can't. Even though the scripture says you can. How many things can you do in Christ? All. all. How many does all leave out? But we, we blaspheme, really, when we complain. We say, God, I can't do that. And that goes against his word. What do you call that when you say opposite of what the word is? It's blasphemy. No, Lord, I was just complaining. No, you weren't. I mean, really, put it, in, put it in context here. All right, so you're looking at all that kind of stuff. He will never change the way he be behaves toward you. Everything that he does, everything he thinks, all comes out of who he is. He can't behave any other way than who he is. And if that backdrop is accurate and he loves you forever, from the beginning of the world, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth until future to come, eternity, he can never do anything toward you that does not show his great love for you. It's impossible. If he could act toward you any other way than love, he would have to change who he is and become not God. So what do you think about that in the midst of your disappointment? In the midst of your frustration, in the midst of your anger at him and other people? In the dissatisfaction that you have because you hadn't received the promise or you haven't moved out in the call that he's put on your life? What do you do with that? You can't negate the fact that his every move, his every thought, his every action is to show his great love for you. And so why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult? It says, in the midst of all that, be zealous and repent. You know what repent is, to change your mind and do different than you have been. But zealous, that's interesting. Zeal, let me, let me just real quickly kind of throw that at you. Uh, zeal comes from one of the root words. There's about three root words as it breaks down, but I don't just want to get to the real root of it here if I can find it on my notes. Zeal has to do with heat. In the very mildest form, it's a warm feeling. When you're zealous about something, you have a warm feeling. But when you break it down a little more, really when you get down to the root of it, it's such a heat that if it were made of liquid it would be boiling whatever you're talking about having zeal if it were metal it would be glowing hot and he's telling us to be that way be zealous be on fire 
be boiling. Well, most of the time when we get boiling, it's because our temperature and our blood pressure went just through the sky, and we're ready to rip somebody's head off, amen? That's not the kind of boiling he's talking about. He's talking about holy fire here. <laughs> be holy fire, fired up, to where you're glowing hot like Jesus you know, that's, you remember John when he went to heaven in Revelation chapter 1, he heard this voice and he turned around. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that in a minute. Don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Being zealous, being hot, it's not anger at your circumstances or at God. It's not frustration. It's not rebellion. It's not any of these that, that point you to repentance. None of those things will point you to repentance. You have to yield to the understanding that God loves you and for whatever reason it is so hard and it's so messed up and I don't see any hope here there is hope because he's doing it out of his great love you got to trust that you got to trust his word you got to trust who he is and if you don't know him if you're asking Lord is this really you it can't be you then you don't know him well enough yet and the very reason he's bringing these circumstances in your life is to bring you to a place where you finally yield and say oh I didn't understand this as a dimension of who you are. And I know that went right over the, some people's heads, I think. I'm not trying to get real deep here. I'm just telling you, if any of this is a big surprise to you, that God would approve of your hardship, in fact, he even engineers it sometimes. Because he loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. He'll bring you to that place where you're broken. And the only place left is to look up. And when you do that, there is such release. There is such deliverance. There is such healing. There is such a change that comes because of his grace and his loving kindness toward you that you get to know him more. I didn't know you were like that, God. Back when I was a new Christian, there was a well-meaning guy one time that in a small group setting teaching. He was talking about shepherds. We were looking at the shepherds, Psalm 23, and et cetera. And he said, for the really rebellious sheep that keeps running away all the time, the shepherd will break its leg or it can't run away. I don't know if that's really true, but I thought, man, that's harsh. Don't you think? Well, the cool part is, knowing that the, he couldn't take care of the sheep couldn't take care of itself with a broken leg, the shepherd would then put it around his neck, front, front legs on one side, and, and he would carry that sheep until he was healed. And then by the time he was healed enough to get down on the ground of his own, he would never run away because he'd been so intimate and so close to the shepherd for so long that he couldn't bear the thought of leaving the sound of his voice. about your circumstances this morning you think maybe that might be something that uh, God might do to make you so broken and so broken down that all there is left is to look up and once you look up he draws so near to you like you've never known before you begin to understand his heart in ways that you've never seen in fact he begins to reveal to you things that you would never see except that you were so broken my late wife had a terminal disease and she was on oxygen 24 7 for a long time and it kept getting worse and worse her heart was getting in so enlarged it was skipping beats uh, she was wearing out pacemakers like this one pacemaker she had put in was supposed to last a minimum of seven years she wore it out in 10 months it was that that kind of stuff she finally got to the point where even on oxygen cranked up she would have to stay in bed and she was turning blue. She had no energy. She got to where she couldn't even hold her Bible in her lap while she was in bed trying to be a good Christian and read and pray. She couldn't hold her arms up, so she had to lay it in her lap, and then she couldn't see, you know, to, to read. And everything was collapsing. She'd already come to the place where she wasn't a good wife anymore. She wasn't a good housekeeper anymore. She wasn't a good mom to the kids anymore. Well, little by little, God began to strip away who she thought she was down to where there was nothing left. 
And it was in that place where she was weeping before the Lord, saying, Lord, I can't even do what I know I'm supposed to be doing to be with you. Except pray and call out on your name. And in that place, she learned such a deep truth that you don't need any of, any of that stuff. You only need me. And he came in the spirit and caught her up and held her in her in her misery, her grief, her disease. Where would she have learned that? Living a normal life. And all of our screaming and yelling and stomping and beating on the walls and saying, God, this is not of you. By your stripes I'm healed. By your promises, I, I know there's better for me. And, I, and, you know, you pray for healing and you pray for healing. It gets worse and worse and worse to the point where when she finally got a transplant, they said, when they took her heart out, they said you had to, about two weeks left to live. That's pretty close, <laughs> y'all. Why would God do such a thing? Why would God allow that to happen? This is not the God that I know. He loves me. Yeah. He agapes me so much that he was willing to let her get to that point in her life to where she learned something about the person that she would never have learned any other way. You don't need any of that. All you need is me. Is God willing to go to those kind of extremes? Maybe not the God you know. It's the God who wants to reveal himself to you more deeply, more intimately than you've ever known. And it's not really your fault. It's just because it hadn't been opened up to you. God's the one, you know, you can never discover anything about God. That's a pretty weird statement for somebody, a preacher or somebody to say, teacher, you don't discover anything about God. You don't have the capacity, even as a regenerate spirit. It's all God. It's all the spirit. He's the one who makes revelation. He's the one who brings understanding. He's the one who gifts you with himself. We look at our circumstances, we look at our city, we look at this nation, we look at all the inhumane and unjustified, wrong, just wrong stuff. And we, we plead with God, why, why, why? And you never get the answer from heaven. You ever ask why and never got the answer? All the time. It's because it's not the answer comes by experience as you live in the misery and as you live in the trial and tribulation. Fiery trials make gold. And that's what the heart and soul of the refiner's fire. Next week I'm going to talk a lot more about the refining process. I'm just kind of breaking it open. Let me just hit some major points and then we'll be done. Revelation 3.18, if we could put that one back up. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Okay, you know that refined gold is more precious than ore, right? In fact, in the scripture it talks about refining gold seven times, seven being the number of completion or perfection. That, well, I don't want to go in on that. It's probably more for next week. But the reason it has to go seven times is that every time that you have to re-refine it up to the number seven, it spins hotter and longer in a molten state so that all the impurities that are actually in solution with the, the per perfect pure gold, that's the only way they can be separated out. It's got to get hotter and it has to stay longer. And so if you've been down this path of uh, journey with Christ for many years, there are going to be things that you're encountering here, even with the large amount of faith that you have and more knowledge and understanding, that are going to vex you for years and years because it's got to be hotter and longer to finally get that last bit of impurity out of your life 
that make sense? Not really? Well, you didn't want to hear it. Maybe that's what, you know. <laughs> Just a little word here. When you hear something and you know it to be true, then you're responsible for that. I'm sorry. That bit of good news there. I've used this before. In the morning when you get up, part, I don't know what everybody's routine is, but you go in the bathroom and you pull out this little bristle brush, right? You put some water on it, you grab a tube, and you squeeze something out on that tube and you stick it in your mouth and brush your teeth. What did you squeeze out of the tube? Hopefully it's toothpaste. You didn't grab the hair cream or something, right? But to be honest, it may not be toothpaste that's really the issue. It's whatever's in the tube. That's what comes out. So what about your situation and the pressure and the heat and all of the junk that's going wrong? You're getting squeezed. What's coming out? You're not finished until God comes out. It's not pure in there until God comes out when you get squeezed. Okay? Now, there are those times when we're full of faith and we've been on the mountaintop with God and something happens and we, re we re respond to it in faith and we speak and declare and proclaim and we get the victory there for 10 minutes. But what about next week? What about after you finish that victory and you're feeling pretty good about it, somebody cuts you off on the way home? What comes out? Or when your kid, you know, drops a gallon, gallon or pickles in the kitchen and it, they're all over everything along with, you know, what comes out? We're not done yet, y'all, you know? It's interesting. I counsel you to buy from me this gold and white garments. And what's the last thing? I said so that you can really see because you're not seeing so good right now. But what do you use to buy that? What, do you, what currency do you have that can buy the refined gold? Anybody? I had to think about that a long time. I went before the Lord for a lot for a long time, and I said, Lord, I don't I understand getting the gold because if you got the gold, then you can buy the I-7, you can buy the white clothes. I, I got that. But how do I buy the gold? What do I use to buy the gold? And it's not just any gold. It's gold that's refined in the fire. Is there a store in heaven, Lord, that I go to to buy refined gold that's been refined in the fire? And he said, no, there is no store that carries that. Well, where do you have to go? You have to go to the refiner's fire where it's made. You have to go to the refiner who's in charge of the fire. That's Jesus. And the price that you pay, there's no currency that you can take to obtain, obtain that gold. You bring what you have on you and in you, and he is the one who melts what is in you to purify. He scrapes off the dross, and he makes and purifies what's already in you. And the time that you spend there and the time that you yield to that process is what you're paying him the, the purpose to remain in that in the hands of the refiner is what is the cost that it's going to cost you to obtain that gold that's eternal. Now in the scripture, when you look at gold, gold is, it speaks of the divine, right? Even in the tabernacle, the temple, gold is in the holy place and the holy of holies. You never found it outside, outside the tent of meeting. Gold is divine. Brass and copper and those kind of things on the outside is all of the earth it's all common okay and so if you go into the refiner's fire and you spend that time there on, of your own volition knowing that it's it's the love of God on that backdrop that keeps you there instead of running away you know we have an option we don't have to stay there right we can balk we can dig our heels in we can scream and yell and we can spend our whole lot of time in the waiting room and and you know, screaming at God, getting mad at him, walking away from the church, all the stuff that we go through, and all we're doing is lengthening the amount of time we're going to be there in that pain, in that conflict, and those, those issues. 
because if you're really His, He's not going to give up on you. And He is because of His great love, He is not willing to stop the process even for a minute to give you a breather to get you back the way you were. It's There's no rest. But look what happens if you submit and you go with God in that. What, what can be accomplished in a short amount of time if you're not kicking and screaming and dragging your heels? The purification process goes quicker and you are much richer for it than if you drag your heels and complain and murmur and rebel. And in that fashion, you get, you get gold that will last forever. And the cool thing about it when you take that gold into a store and you're ready to get that ISAF so you can see real well and the clothing, it's like now if you go to the store and you buy new, new clothes, new dress or whatever, you go in with a currency right in your pocket, you find what you want, you take it to the counter, you plunk, plunk down your currency and then you, get the, and you walk away with the item, but you, you left the currency on the desk or in there till. Amen? That's the way it works in the natural. It doesn't work that way in the spiritual when you go to the fire and he makes that gold in you, that gold that is divine is actually his character. I'm beginning to look a little like Jesus now. You know that old saying is repeated a lot that the, the smelter looks at the gold while it's in molten and if he can see himself, then it's getting there, right? That's that idea. It's his character, golden character in me that he's after. Look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He's given you leaders. He's given you men and women, right? To do the work of the ministry so that you can fill up the stature and fullness of Christ. That's the goal, the stature and fullness of Christ. So how do you get there, minister? Every one of us. That's a whole other sermon. I won't even go. I can break that one open too. But That's what's on God's mind, is to make us like him. Where when the world looks at us, they see him. If we go to a prison somewhere and offer them a, a refreshing drink of living water and they look at us, Jesus wants them to see the nail print on our hand as we offer it. And when we spend that time in the fire to obtain that gold and we say, you know, I'm going to go get that beautiful white raiment to wear. I'm going to go get... ISAP so that I can see spiritually for real and not what I think I see but what I re what really is because Jesus has a different idea about what we see amen than we do so you go into the store in heaven and you say I want to get that that white garment right and so you don't take currency the gold is in you how are you going to take that out when you go into the heavenly storehouse for a gift or for a blessing, or for whatever God's put on your heart by faith to reach up and violently take hold of, the gold that needs to pay for that is in you. And so the storekeeper looks and says, Oh, you just walked in. I know who you are. I can see who you are by the gold that's in you. Here. And he gives you that white garment. Or he gives you that I salve. And you walk out not having left the currency in his till, you get the stuff and you keep the gold. Because it's not an issue of what you've got, how much you have, if you can afford it. The issue is who you are entitles you to receive. There's a lot of things we want out of the heavenly storehouse that we're not going to receive until we have the character to use it right. And to honor the name of the one who's given it. Holy fire. That's what zeal really is. Holy fire in us. You know, we're not the only ones to ever have, have that. When you look at scripture and you, t and you look at Jesus, Revelation chapter 1, it describes him. It says he has eyes of fire. That's because he's still on fire inside. But he has feet of burnished bronze. Burnished bronze is, uh, in fact, that scripture, do we have Revelation in 1-1 one, one in the list? I don't know if I put that up there. If you could find Revelation 1-1, one, one, I want you to see 
not one one. It's one uh, uh, twelve or thirteen, maybe. By the time he wakes up and sees the risen Christ, yeah, twelve, one twelve. That's where it starts. Look at fifteen. First Revelation one fifteen. 14 says, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. 15, his feet were like what? Fine brass. Another one says burnished brass or bronze, as if refined in a furnace. Lord just opened this up for me last week. You know, I said things golden are in the holy place and in the holy place. They speak of divine nature, right? And so... When you look at this picture of Christ, all of a sudden, he's, his eyes are flame of fire, and et cetera, but his feet are brass. Where do you find brass? In the tabernacle, for example. It's outside in the courtyard where sin is dealt with. It's like that, that's a common place. That's even sometimes an unholy place when people bring their sin in to, to be forgiven, to kill the sacrifice, put their hands on it, you know, and transfer their sin. That's where sin's dealt with. What did Jesus come here to do? Seek and save that which was lost. Make a way where there was no way for us to be redeemed. Where did he walk? In a sin-swept world. Laid his glory aside. It's like, I get this picture when you really begin to look at the original language. It's like he's going to lay all his rights as God, his, his power, his, you know, who he is, not so much who he is, but what he's got to work with, basically, and the rights that are his to be worshipped, the right to worship, to be worshipped and, and exalted. Not He laid all that down so that he could step down into a sin-swept world as if he's taking his shoes off and easing down into a cesspool. Holy and righteous Son of God. Knowing that once he got in the cesspool, he was going to be mistreated and eventually killed. But that was the plan. Now, he walked this earth, this sin sweat world, mis maligned, mistreated, et cetera, et cetera. Even the guys that were with him were like, duh, you know. Sometimes he said, how long am I going to have to put up with you guys? <laughs> You're just not getting it, you know. He, he got frustrated too. He never sinned like we do. But the whole issue is burnished bronze belongs in the outside. It's not in the holy place and the holy of holies. But the reason that he has burnished bronze feet is because he too walked through what we're walking through. Disappointment. Pressure. Dryness. The temptation to, to give up. Injury. Not physical, I'm talking heart injuries. People abandon him. People betrayed him. He did it all. And because of the holy fire that was in him, the zeal that was in him, it caused that brass to be refined in his feet. So now that he's in heaven, his eyes are still on fire with that holy zeal. But his feet are proof that he went through everything that we're going through. But he's got victory because the color of his feet tell the tale of refining. Even Jesus, Scripture says, he found obedience in doing what God said even obedience unto death burnished bronze for feet because he trod the sin, sin, sin sweat world and he did it right he got it right and the proof is in heaven for all to see he picked up more than just nail prints. 
that is such huge revelation because he became a man, part of a fallen race with the ability to fail. But he never failed and he never sinned. He didn't even pretend to know what was coming next. The scripture says, I tell you truly, he says, I don't do anything on my own initiative. Even though he's a creator of the earth, I don't do anything on my own free will. I only do what I see my father is already doing. He laid down his prerogative to do anything except what God and he's, he did it as an example to us. That's the way the perfect man is supposed to operate. And that's who he's making us to be, a perfect man, perfect woman, perfect dad, perfect mom, whatever hat you want to put on it. And so I'm, I'm going to call quits on this part of it, but next week we're going to actually look at the refining process. But I'm here to tell you, whatever situation you're in, that creates you pressure and heat and dissatisfaction, disappointment, grief, I mean, whatever emotion you want to put on it. If especially if it's been going on a long time and there's no end to it, but you can't quit, you can't change your situation, you're frustrated, consider that it might be directly, the situation you're in is directly from the hand of God. And he wants you there for a purpose. And so if you'll quit screaming and kicking and dragging your heels and go with God, it may go quicker. But certainly, even if it doesn't go quicker, when you get out the other side, you're going to be more like him because that's why he sends it. Now, when it gets discomfort, that's when the flesh really rises up more than just normal because it's, it's rebuking. It wants to get away from that heat, and, and it doesn't want what, you know, it's not wanting what God wants out of that heat and that experience. You've got to go with God through, your, through the furnace. It'll, if you don't, it'll take you longer to go through the fire, and you may not receive the riches that, you're, that you should. Okay? We can, you know you can shortchange yourself on the grace of God, right? By unbelief, that's one of the main ways. But just rebellion, it's just as bad as unbelief. It, in fact, it's probably kin. You can cut it short and not receive everything God wanted to give you. Don't do that. Pay attention to what impurities you see during the refining process, okay? It's like when, if everything's so discomfort, in discomfort at work or whatever, pay attention to the bad habits that are coming out, the wrong thinking, the complaints and murmuring, the impure beliefs that are based on anything other than the Word of God. I'm just not worthy. I deserve this. That's not in the Word. What you deserve, you already escaped. Jesus took it on himself. Amen? They will be what God is revealing. All those things, if you open your eyes and look, what's being revealed here in this pressure? What's coming out of the tube? And if it's not of God, that's exactly what he's working on to scrape away and reset our thinking, reset our belief system to, to go with what God says. Change your perspective on the refining process. He is working into you the riches that you will enjoy forever and that you will display forever. God is fashioning us for an eternity with Him. Not for this little pittance of time that we have on this earth. Now, I'm already 63 and i got a long way to go. So he's liable to cram in a whole lot of fire in, in a short amount of time that just absolutely devastates me so that I can be who he's envisioned or my destiny to be, right? If you're young, you might as well just go now. Because it may not be as fierce and may, it might not be as harsh. And when you think about where we are in the timeline, in the end time, There's not much time left, y'all. But as you go through those things, as you go through your day, your week, your month, and you view your circumstances and all of the emotions that it raises and the frustration and anger, just weariness. Just flat, it just wears you down to nothing. 
look past those and look at the backdrop and realize that the one who loves you with a never-ending, pure agape wants you to receive out of this purity and holiness. Let the holy fire of God that he manifests through your circumstance, your difficulties, and the tribulation that you're going through. It's, it, the world thinks it's tearing you up. Really, it's God sending holy fire to refine you and bring out of you a sheen and a priceless character of God himself. Don't short your change. Don't shortchange yourself. Honor him. Submit. And watch him do something just, you'll be shouting the praises for eternity for the decision that you might make today. Amen. Would you stand? Kept you longer than I wanted, but I, I trust that God has spoken. And next week we're going to actually get down to some nitty gritty things about being in the furnace. And it's all designed to, get, to give you uh, hope to give you tools, to give you uh, an outlook that will cause you to run the race in perseverance and godly endurance. Amen? To make you who God's making you and me, us, together. Father, I speak blessing on these. And I pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit will have uh, imparted to hearts uh, those things that will cause them to be able to endure hard times and situations even with grace and that as you work in them through this Lord that they will release themselves into your care knowing that you cannot act toward them in any way except to show your great love for them and even though it hurts even though it's uncomfortable it just sucks sometimes God you're not ignorant of all that and yet that's what it's going to take those kind of things to to purify, purify, give us release from the very things that want to kill us. You want to purge that out with your holy fire, O oh God. Cause us to be willing to allow that. In fact, put it in our hearts to where we can't stand mediocrity anymore, Lord. We have to go for the gold. Make it so disgusting to us, Lord, that we're willing to walk through fire with you as long as you're there be done with the common and the mediocre. In fact, to be done with the very things that want to take our life and our steal our joy and our pleasure that will last forever. Father, we just bless your name. For the fathers, Lord, I thank you for them and what they, uh, what you're doing in us as men in this church. I pray, oh God, that today would be a day of celebration but also a day of renewal that we would once again turn to you to follow hard after you. Give us a heart like David, that we would chase you down and that we wouldn't be satisfied with anything less than your presence. As we pray in Christ's name, amen.